welcome to the Frontline Podcast, brought to you in association with the Atler Group. Atler Group is a collaboration of businesses with a collective history of over 130 years, bringing financial solution to its clients in the world of accountancy, audit, advisory, fiduciary and retirement benefit solutions. Visit atler.im today. On the Frontline Podcast, we chat to leaders in business and successful entrepreneurs to bring you their in-depth and bite-sized opinions that will add value to you and your mind. Uh, maybe just set the scene about your background, your studies, what you do now, and then we can kind of explore it from there, if that's all right. Yeah, um, so my background is marine science. I studied marine science down at Plymouth University. Um I grew up on the island, so I spent a lot of time um, around our beautiful coastlines and seas. Um, my dad was a commercial diver, so I spent a lot of my time snorkeling with the seals around the island and staring in rock pools and things like that, which you know gave me my first kind of interest in the seas. Um, and then I've been fortunate enough to work in various different places, um, diving all over the world. Um, I've sailed across the Pacific, and now I work for the Isle of Man government, so I've done lot of work on marine plastics but at the moment i'm working on a blue carbon project which is more related to climate change okay those to dig in there let me start with a Mm. stupid question commercial diver what does a commercial diver do so i guess it's just be diving for um as your profession so he would work on oil rigs actually out in the north sea in the 80s um so yeah so there's a problem underwater they send the deep sea diver in as the case maybe yeah pretty crazy diving and down to big depths and um yeah quite a dangerous profession really did you learn to dive at a young age yeah i was in the water snorkeling and diving uh from about four or five my dad used to take us in with like a small bailout bottle which uh the kind of small bottles maybe about the size of your forearm that you kind of use it if you need in a rescue situation, but they're actually quite perfect for a, for a four or five year old to go under the water and have a go at seeing what it's like under okay. there. Okay, and uh, you mentioned about going to Plymouth. Is that renowned for ocean work? Yeah, okay. Plymouth Sorry, is my terminology. So really yeah, no, horrendous. it's a it's a good centre for um, ocean science, and they've got um, it's on the coast. They're on the coast, obviously. Um, they've got the Marine Biological so- um, Association down there, which is an institution that's been around for hundreds of years. But actually Isle of Man in itself is a real centre for for marine sciences and a lot of my lectures all had connections to the Isle of Man. Okay. So what what would you talk us through at, at uni? What kind of what are you what science is it? Is it you're learning day to day? Is it how to yeah, to explain? Yeah, so my well my undergraduate degree was ocean science. So you're really learning about physical oceanography, um, chemical um what's going on with the chemistry in, in the shallow waters in you know mid waters at depth um the biological side of things so what animals are living there and why and what roles they all play and um, and actually a lot about the weather um and climate and and i guess ocean science um and this is where it kind of differs probably from being a marine biologist is much more of a kind of a large scale holistic view of of how the, our systems work and how our oceans affect weather and climate and how um, species and habitats all affect the water columns so it's a really kind of broad view of, of how our ocean works and how it affects us and and the rest of the planet and how does ocean affect the climate oh. a very big question oh it's huge high level oh it, it affects it massively i mean you have this um system called the global ocean <laughs> conveyor belt which is basically this Um, movement of water all around our oceans so all our oceans are are connected um, and basically through warm and cold water it it kind of conveys all the temperature and heat around our planet so I think one parcel of water um, in the global conveyor belt will take about a thousand years to travel right around our uh, our oceans which is pretty amazing but you imagine that's that's moving all that heat around the planet so it's moving heat from the from the equator to the poles and vice versa um, and it's changing weather systems, pressure systems. Yeah, it's it's playing a very important role. And the recording of those changes of, say, sea temperature, if that's the case, is that, I assume that's something more recently started record, recording as in maybe the last 100 years? I don't know. How far does data go back to? Yeah, I mean, long-term data sets are really, really valuable. And it's probably in the last couple of hundred years that we've been taking good, consistent records. 
The Isle of Man has actually got one of the longest running time series for ocean temperature in the world because we had the old um, biological station down in Port Erin, um, and that's been there for you know a hundred so years. Um, so that's that's a really important data set. But yeah, it's um, we can look we can look at our, um, temperatures and changes long term in di- in different ways. So, so the, and again, temperature wise, is that at surface level? At you know, is the standards of surface level temperature five hundred feet, a thousand feet? I don't know. Is do you fix it into kind of brackets? I mean, it it will depend where you are and um, how deep it is and what what currents it's affected by. Um, different bodies of water are called different things. So you have like the Antarctic deep water and, and, you know, they all kind of move around as different water bodies and they all have different properties, um, different salinities. So um, that affects things quite a lot as well, how salty the water, the sea is. It's, it varies in saltiness <laughs> depending on where you are. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, how, how is salt levels change in that? So just depending on how much fresh water you're getting it in flowed into those areas. So if you imagine places up in Greenland and they've got glaciers melting, the the level of fresh water input there is high or um where the rainfall is high or rivers flowing into systems and um that all changes the density and it's the same way that, you know, uh high pressure will, will move to low pressure in um in the air it's the same kind of system in the ocean so that's where you get kind of some of those larger currents moving around our ocean like the gulf stream that's happening because you have two different water masses of different densities and temperatures and they're kind of moving to try and counteract and balance each other out if that yeah. makes sense yeah kind of so <laughs> more not your explanation but my, <laughs> you're not brilliant. Um, so then when you're looking at oceans they if we talk a little bit about climate some of the bits I've read online is when we talk about CO, CO2 emissions, my understanding is that we're all producing that. We're trying to bring that down to climate change. One of the saviors of the earth at the moment is the ocean. It's sucking up a lot of that CO2. Is mm-hmm. that kind of... Yeah, our oceans absorb a huge amount of um, the earth's excess heat and CO2. Um, and that's just one of its roles, you know, naturally. Um... Same question for that. How is it doing that? Um, so a lot of the CO2 is being collected by um, phytoplankton. So there's two different types of plankton in our oceans. There's phytoplankton and zooplankton. Phytoplankton are the plants and zooplankton are the animals. And phytoplankton acts in the same way that trees and, and plants do on, on land. And they absorb CO2 and release oxygen. So actually every second breath we take is because we have a healthy ocean because it, we don't kind of realize, I think a lot of people don't realize how much oxygen we actually get from our oceans and, and the species that live in there. Okay, just super quick. How, how does that oxygen, you know, again, we, I suppose we think of plants in the ocean that are underwater, if they're producing the oxygen, is that flowing to the surface and then. And perspiring yeah, out. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. All right, okay. So you wouldn't see a lot of that. Again, we look, think about putting our head under the water and bubbles. But I presume there's micro versions of that happening at plants. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and, mm. and 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 complex interactions between those organisms and and the water column, and then interactions between the water column and and the atmosphere, and it's all kind of. It's... And the reverse is when CO two is going in there, they're yeah. using that. So do, the the plankton, they're they're obviously not doing it because they're trying to be good. Is that something they survive on, much like trees need? Yeah, yeah. that's just that. That's just how they function. Okay. Um. So you'll find. You know, every species on Earth has, fills an important niche, doesn't it? And that, you know, we tend to be the species that kind of puts our foot into things a little bit. But yeah, everything has its role and, and plays quite an important life function. How much of the oceans take the CO2 that we produce? Um, you, do you mean, does it vary? Yeah, I suppose I think, let's say the world produced 100 cubic metres of C2O. How much goes and wrecks the ozone layer? How much goes that the ocean suck in and save for us? Oh, that, I'd have I to look know. up the exact figures. But is it kind of like 50-50 or does the ocean take a good chunk of the, the Earth's CO2? But I presume it struggles because we're producing more and more of it. Yeah, um, I mean, it's taking, a, it's taking a lot, but that's why it's actually becoming more acidic um, because it's kind of reached its capacity to absorb CO2. So it's still absorbing, but actually it's making the the water column more acidic in doing so um changing the actual chemical makeup of our seas um which has implications for um well for all positive ones i guess 
Um, well, uh, yeah, it's funny actually because some species like um, seaweeds and things like that actually will benefit from slightly more CO2 in the ocean, but actually are organisms that or animals sorry i'm trying we're talking about science and i'm trying to not talk about it in a really sciencey <laughs> way because it's hard to kind of put those hats on but um like the animals that you that have shells you know are really negatively impacted because they need to build those their shells with calcium carbonate and a more acidic ocean means that they really struggle to build those those shells so um yeah i think overall it's it's definitely a negative thing so those looking back at the studies and the impacts, that's the type of thing as well. You'd be looking at acidity within different areas of the ocean, et cetera. Yeah, so, and it's interesting. So um, there's obviously the, car- the CO2 that's dissolved in our in our water column. Um, Can I just say water column? Just define that a little bit more for us. Yeah, the water column is just defined as, so if you imagine from the surface hmm. of, of the ocean down to the seafloor, and if you, to, to, I guess, Imagine a column, a rectangular okay. column going down. You you can you have different layers right. of the ocean, and and they're kind of called different things. So that's what I'm referring to when I say water column. Mm. Um, yeah, you have you have the CO2 that's dissolved in the ocean, but actually, our the habitats in our ocean can absorb a lot of CO2 naturally, which is actually blue carbon. So that's if you restore and protect those habitats. They play a really important role in storing carbon, keeping out of the water, the excess out of the water column, um, and, and taking it out of our atmosphere. So that's kind of is that the underwater come. equivalent of what we again I was laying here talk about planting more trees. Yeah, absolutely. It's the underwater version of that. Yeah. So habitats like seagrass and um, salt marsh, or and even marine sediment, which is not very sexy <laughs> for your <laughs> listeners, but actually is quite important in terms of how much carbon it can store. Um, so seagrass, for example, can store two to five times more carbon than um, a tropical rainforest. Um, and if you think that we've lost about 90% of our seagrass meadows around the UK alone in the last 100 years, you imagine how much less carbon is being stored in those habitats. Um, and the amazing thing about blue carbon is that it could be stored for much longer timescales than like terrestrial carbon. Those cycles kind of tend to be more short-lived. You know, if you think about the lifespan of a tree or... Um, so that'd be terrestrial carbon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, or, you know, if you, it's a lot easier to set the land on fire than it is to set the bottom of the sea on fire. So you actually find that the carbon stored in our ocean can be stored for thousands and thousands of years very safely, whereas actually it's a bit more vulnerable. So again, the non-layman, if you, sorry, I was going to say, if probably you get a tree... Ask, you're probably going to ask the same question yeah. there when you talk about how are you... Yeah, trees, you plant them, it happens. How are you replicating that with CMOS and the, and those sort of things of how do you get more? I say, when are you planting? Are you taking? I uh, assume they have to, like yeah, stupid question again. Do they don't have seeds or anything like that? How do you pick them up and then pl- create version of, version of plantations underwater? Of how how do you replicate that? Yeah, so seagrass actually is does have have seeds. It's okay. the only species of. Um, flowering kind of plant in the ocean um it actually acts it's it's a really interesting plant they think that crabs and small crustaceans and things like that actually pollinate the the seagrass flowers in the same way that bees um pollinate things on land so it's that's a really interesting mm. area i think anyway but yeah they have seeds so there's different ways that you can restore those habitats um you can collect the seeds and germinate them and and like you do on land you know try and and you plant them up in the sea in the seabed as long as you've got all the things that have damaged them in the first place as long as you've kind of mitigated against that of course it's important to get your water quality as good as possible um and then you can either yeah do it with seeds um, and replant seeds or you can transplant seedlings uh kind of smaller plants and um put them into a new site um, you mentioned the seagrass number, maybe eighty ninety percent has been destroyed. Mm. What's destroyed that? They think it's a, a various, um, you know, various causes. Um, so seagrass naturally lives in very shallow water. It needs sunlight, um, the same way that plants do on land. Um, it needs nice, clear waters, and we fat we find it typically, especially in the UK, in their in their estuaries and shallow seas around the Isle of Man. We get it in our shallow shallow waters. Um, and 
we obviously went through a large period of, um, still are, of, of development and the Industrial Revolution. And that meant that we've actually been polluting our river, river systems and coastal systems for the last 200 years. Um, a lot of coastal development has kind of made it much, the water quality around our coast much worse. Um, things like sewage outflowing into our into our oceans was also decimated them and then they've also if you <laughs> could imagine a worse fate for them they had a, a a disease as well that took out a lot of them in the in the 1970s mm. as well so it's kind of a, a perfect storm for them in terms of our impact on our coastlines we haven't really been thinking about ocean health over the last two three hundred years and um yeah disease as well so we talk about an estuary and pollution right? how are humans polluting that the like you talk about sewerage I, I don't know does sewerage still get dumped out of sea i don't know uh what, what kind of damage where's it coming from i appreciate it's come from humans but doing what actions yeah um so yeah we still have two sites on an island that we pump raw sewage into the ocean how um, far out is that pumped out not very far at all isn't it whether I'm making it so it's not the photos I've seen like Peel. It's off Peel Breakwater and yeah. off uh, yeah. Laxey. There are like photos well. of not looking like water, <laughs> should yeah. we say. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is that treated before it's pumped out? No, no. Right, so we're talking like half a mile? Oh, like, no, probably. Like you could probably see it coming off the breakwater. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I think there are plans in place to put sewage treatment there, but it's just taking a bit of time. So that's one kind of style of pollution um industry and the outflows from factories and and um obviously we we've, we've now um kind of outsourced in the uk really a lot of our pollution we brought in legislation that stopped a lot of those really polluting activities through industry and tended to outsource all that pollution to china now there's we kind of rely on our products being made in china which is polluting their waterways but before that we were really putting a lot of nasty chemicals. Um, I mean, they used to say that the solution to pollution is dilution and the perfect place to do that was in the ocean. So they would be putting nuclear waste, you know, chemical residues, waste, um, all sorts of nasty things, pollution. Um, and then just development on the coastline anyway. You know, if you really rough up the seabed and it becomes really turbid, you can't see that, that that's not good for seagrasses and maybe right. things like that as well. So we look when on a global perspective if certain countries end up pulling their sleeves up and doing what they do, I assume there's ultimately countries that maybe are less bothered about that climate change or that climate issue. And I, I'm not picking on China, for example, but if it's just using them as that example, they might not have legislation, they'd just be dumping. Yeah, you'd stuff. you'd be surprised by China actually. They're actually doing quite a lot and I like, uh, don't mean you take me to Yeah, no, but I mean yeah. I think I think that's a common view that we have in the West that look how virtuous we are. It must be so many, there must be so many other countries. Um, I've spent years dumping. Not ourselves. giving a hoot. Yeah. yeah and, and dumping away. And um, I'd say that a lot of those countries are at the forefront of environmental pollution and really feeling the impacts of that. You know, we are, I don't know if fortunate is the right word, but we have got ourselves into a position that we did a lot of our polluting a long time ago so it's kind of in the back of our minds and we've outsourced that because we're a rich nation to countries that have to make those choices whether they want to or not because they need to feed their families essentially and they don't have they aren't don't live in as rich of a nation as us um but i think because of that they are far more aware of the impacts that they are having on the on the on the, on the well the environment in general really um, and for us, sometimes it's harder for us to see those impacts because it is just so easy just to go onto Amazon and, and buy something and, and have absolutely no idea how it was made or how the person was paid to, you know, climate change and environmental, uh, the environmental challenges we face are so wrapped up in the way that we treat other people, um, how they live their lives and, 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 and treating people fairly and, um, yeah. Yeah. I've gone off on a bit of a tangent, but basically it's about, I think in the West, it's very easy for us not to mm. see the problems that we are creating because we've got ourselves in a very comfortable position where we can really order what we want, where we want, without having to ask any of the questions about where it came from. Mm. Okay. Again, probably a tough subject, uh, question, but 
how where do you see the solution in that then are you saying it should we should be becoming more local or is it more awareness of well, by doing this what impact you are having i think it's a mixture of the two and i think um you know I'm definitely not advocating everybody only eats turnips at a certain time of year because that's all you can get on the Isle of Man. But um, I definitely advocate for asking more questions about where things are coming from. Is there a potential to get that more local and, and understanding the story that comes behind the products that you're buying, um, supporting brands that have strong, sustainable, ethical um, values to them and, and aren't you know exploiting people on other sides of the world because it is all connected um yeah so i think i yeah i advocate for being more curious yeah. about what you consume what you buy what you support you know that is one of the most important things anybody can do is is using that money that everybody's worked so hard for to vote for the kind of world we want in the future and make sure that we're spending it with brands and, and with people that that care and, and give a shit. We're, you know, sorry to swear. I don't know if you're allowed to swear on your yep. podcast, but, you know, not paying people to trash the planet and treat people badly, really. It's a big push in the corporate space, ESG. Do you feel, maybe I haven't got an opinion, that, that some of that's just a pun intended hot air? I think it's the same as 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 everything. There'll be a range of people and there'll definitely be the people that just want to tick a box, but they're also really um, genuine companies that, that want to do the right thing. And, you know, we're all people at the end of the day and we all have loved ones and we all want the best for them. Um, so I think people are now starting to make those connections. And I think, you know, a little while ago, people would just see the environment as like a distant far off thing that didn't affect them but people are now starting to understand that we're actually all connected to it and if you want your children to have a a bright and prosperous future and, and for us you know it's it's on our doorstep it's about um actually starting to care and and it's not just about the bottom line anymore and 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 taking that approach especially now has benefits for businesses anyway it's it's um it's profitable to actually genuinely care and i think people are starting to see that and make that change not that we like to use the word covid anymore but during that time there was certainly in those initial phases we had no planes going and people talking about clearer skies do you think that that we that the world went through will not accelerate the process but maybe certainly slow down the people having appreciation of yeah maybe i don't need to fly anymore do you think that as much as there's bad things like covid that was something that we all learn a little bit from that maybe people environmentalists have been talking about a little bit more before yeah i'm not sure i i, I think i was probably one of the you know i think a lot of people felt that kind of connection that everybody felt maybe in that first lockdown of, of um spending more time in nature everything slowed down a bit everybody was making banana bread and going on walks and things like that um and I think at that time, I possibly quite naively thought that maybe we'd have more of a realization that we did. But um, I mean, the systems that we've kind of created are so ingrained in us. I think when things went back to normal, you know, myself included, it was very easy to kind of to forget a little bit of that. And I think in modern day, we've got life, we've got so many things to think about all the time that actually we rarely give ourselves that space to get back to that place. I think everybody, I think it gave everybody a realization that they enjoyed that and would like it a little bit more and maybe didn't need to be running around like a headless chicken all the time. But I think we need to take a few more steps to actually put that into action. You know, I, I think it doesn't just come naturally. You have to make some changes. Just, just with that, what do you think that will ever happen or is it? I think so. I think it's, I think it's already happening and I think, you know, speaking about business and things, things like that, I think they're they're seeing more and more that if they give their employees more time um, to enjoy life, that they do better work and they're happier and they're off sick less. And you know, I know um, there are several large companies advocating, well, lots of companies advocating for the four day week, um, and I think that's for me, exactly the route we need to go down in terms of tackling climate change and a lot of the environmental problems we face because 
we need to step back and have time to think and to use our intuition and our wisdom to come up with, you know, solutions. It's not just about buying more and just buying green things. It's not about like, oh, we'll all just get an electric car and we'll be fine. I think we all know that it's that we need to maybe not go back at all. I'm not advocating to go back and live in a mud hut and not have electricity, et cetera, et cetera. But I think we all know and would like to have a little bit more time to spend with our families, to be able to cook a nice meal and take time over that, to go for a walk in nature um, and, and not just feel like we're completely frazzled and rushed all the time. And those those nice scenes, they impact doing that then, explain it, that link that to then was living in a more climate-friendly place. Yeah. Um, well, I, I mean, I think when you do that, you you feel like you need, or at least I do feel like I, I need less. I don't, I think we've kind of got ourselves into a lot of this, um, these problems through the amount that we consume. Um, and it's interesting since the 1960s, GDP has, has, has doubled, but our perceived happiness has, has not. So we've kind of got ourselves into this crazy, which, which through no fault of our own, because it was, fed to us through through marketing and a very and very clever you know marketing system in the 1950s where it's shown that well we'll, we'll actually change our, our approach to how we, what we value and instead of buying what we need we'll buy what we want so we we started buying and consuming more and suddenly you defined yourself with what kind of car you had where you went on holiday um you could you know compared yourself to your neighbor you needed one phone and then you needed an upgrade and then you needed an upgrade and then you needed a whole wardrobe of clothes and actually science shows that we're not happier through that we don't you know we don't need this abundance of stuff that all takes energy and resources and oil and water um to create so that's very much putting all all that aside and really just enjoying what we have put it away and go off to you know take some time friends family walk you know see the natural uh, scenery and everything that we, that we have, which is great on our island, and you, you know, de stress and everything like that because you're putting all these, na- you know, these man made stresses to a side, which are not, you know, natural. Feel happier. Yeah. And I think for me, where that connection comes in is where giving people more space to kind of follow their intuition and figure out what they want rather than plugging them into this system where they kind of go to work nine to five, work for someone they don't really want to be doing because they have to pay for a load of stuff that maybe half of it they don't really want, but they think that they should have. Um, It's kind of building onto the system when actually what we could be doing is is thinking actually we could probably do things differently and, and maybe that person really loves baking and wants to be a baker or something like that. And, and we start building communities out of people that really want to do what they want to do and, and are building it through love and passion and interest and joy. And we're creating a much nicer society to live in that people aren't trying to then escape from or buy their way out of. Yeah. I'm obviously not going to say no. Is that realistic in the sense of the world's run by the corporations, the sale, the shell, the profits, the... Is that possible, I suppose? Anyone running a business is like, maybe the four-day week works and they can make the bottom line still work. I don't know. I'm just playing devil's advocate. Yeah, I think... There's a belief that can happen. Yeah, I think, well, I think we have have choices, don't we? And humans are incredible at coming up with solutions to things. You know, we've, look at what we've built around... Do we want to? I think think that's the question. I think, do we want to? Are we at that stage yet? I don't know. Uh, I that think my counter, not my counter argument, but we have enough producing enough food in the world to feed everyone in the world. Yeah, heart, you know, a massive chunk of people are still hungry and go bed undernourished and underfed in what probably the Western world, let alone the less developed worlds and mm. worlds. And we haven't had a willpower as a globe, as a human race, to fix that problem. So we can't do that. I'm not saying we can't do it, but I just that willpower. And again, I'm not trying to put a negative spin on it. It must just be a no. I think a challenge. It is a huge challenge and I think I think when you meet 
individuals and you really connect with them, you realize that actually there is capacity for everybody to want that and to act actively work towards it, you know, bar maybe a small few. Um, I mean, who wouldn't want to live in a yeah. cleaner world, a better planet, less pollution? Yeah. I think, again, I think it comes down to having the space to, to imagine that. I don't think we really give ourselves any space to imagine something different anymore. I think we're very good at um, just kind of shrugging our shoulders and saying, well, this is how, this is the system, this is the corporates, this is the oils. And actually, throughout history quite a lot of the time it's been one or two individuals in fact there's an amazing quote i can't remember remember the lady who says i'll have to look it up but she says never for a moment believe that a a, you know small group of um passionate people can change the world and indeed it's the only thing that ever has you know so i think movements change i mean look at how much the world has changed in the last 15 years the last 30 years the last you know since the 1960s undoubtedly the world will change in the next 10, 15 years. We have a choice whether that looks like societal breakdown or, you know, somewhere along that track or whether we start building something better. And I think since the pandemic, definitely, I think people are realising that they are less and less, um, plea- that they don't want what we have. I think there's, a, I don't know if you feel that, but I feel like there's a murmuring of, I'm actually getting a little bit sick of how things are working and I don't believe, I don't trust our political system and actually I'm a bit over these corporates treating me like this. I'm just a consumer, you know. Um, Yeah. yeah. I mean, I hate the word consumer. I think people should be called people, not just just consuming things. Um, So I think things are changing and the speed at which things can change now with phones and the internet and things like that. Um, I think it just takes enough people to have the space to imagine something different. Yeah, okay. So some questions I want to ask out the back of that, but I just want to get technical again for a few minutes. So let's talk carbon. So mm-hmm. we talk about uh, carbon dioxide. No idea what that is, other than car produces it and you we other, produce other it. Things. Yeah, okay. So <laughs> uh, you know, it's a it's a chemical, I assume, and it's taught me through. Uh, so it's produ- so let's so say- it's a compound okay. made of it's it's two um molecules well, it's carbon and oxygen that have joined together to mm-hmm. make CO2. So yeah, something very natural that you know, every time we breathe out, we're breathing out um CO2 and a mix of other gases. Um and yeah, when we burn oil and fossil fuels, that releases CO2. So I think the best way to describe, because I think sometimes people are confused and they go well um you know when we that trees absorb co2 surely putting more co2 into the atmosphere is is a good thing um and actually i think it's quite handy to think about um oil and gas for what it actually is which is plant matter um that was buried millions and millions of years ago um and and I and didn't decompose enough, so the carbon wasn't released then naturally, and it's created these deposits of of coal and and oil and gas. Um, now, what that basically is is fossilized. That's a quick question there. So each of those different coal, oil, they have a common theme, which is carbon within them. Well, yeah. So I think, if I remember correctly, coal is. Um, I flunk it's, chemistry, by the way. <laughs> I'm not a chemist by <laughs> any means. So if any chemists are listening and I'm butchering this, yeah. I apologize. I'm trying my best. Um, I think coal was as trees and forests that weren't able to decompose. But basically the, the way that plants get energy is, is um, sunlight reaches them through um, phosphorescence and then they, they have a carbon exchange. And basically they're all made, we're all made of carbon basically. So it's, Things, coal, oil, and gas are things that were made of carbon, like all of us, um, millions and millions of years ago, and then were, weren't were able to decompose for whatever reason and got pressured and pressured and pressured and made of oil and gas. So when we're mining and, and, um, and pulling out all those deposits of oil, gas, and, and coal, what we're actually burning is is carbon that was meant to be in the carbon cycle millions of years ago. So we're upsetting that balance. You know what I mean? We're not burning. When we burn 
you know, if we chop down a tree and burn that, that carbon there is part of this carbon cycle. Whereas coal and gas is, is carbon from millions and millions of years ago that we are re-releasing back into our atmosphere. So that's where that we can't, we are doing that as a very human induced, you know, that's, and we're increasing that balance and naturally carbon is very much part of our natural cycle. But um, the carbon there was meant to stay there. It wasn't for us to mine up. <laughs> I'm cool with that. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. So let's just go back to oceans. So I've got some interesting facts here. Okay. Uh, can I? Can I? Uh, can I ask a question around uh, climate change? You go for it. I'll so do that, my best. Yeah. So, so <laughs> no we, we touched. Yeah, we, we we touched on before we came on air that uh, obviously oceans your specialty. If we listen to, I suppose, headlines, media, we talk about corporations earlier, but media, there's a there's a climate change issue. There's, well, as we're recording this, well, I suppose there's a heat wave around. Uh, and, and naturally, every summer, everyone says, this is climate change because of the change in temperature. As a headline fact, is that generally correct? I think it's important not to get confused between weather and climate. So weather is... Short term on a on a maybe week by week basis, the weather changes um, month by month. Um, climate is the long term trend in temperatures um, over a longer time span. Um, so it's like when people you often hear people on the street and they go, "God, it's bloody freezing! What's this climate change?" Yeah, my accent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that's the weather. <laughs> That's okay. not climate, but actually, there's a uh, there's a fantastic infographic I saw on Twitter the other day that NASA had done, and and it showed how the years had, well, since the 1960s, increased on temperature, and they are just getting hotter and hotter and hotter. So I think like a heat map. I might see in that. Um, I think there's different versions. Okay. So this was like a circle, um, of, and it, and it showed gotcha. kind of yeah, just basically it getting hotter and hotter and hotter. The the years are getting hotter, so not. Not in terms of weather, in terms of of climate, and I think you know in the last the last ten years have been the hot, some of the hottest on on record, and um, you know we said earlier that we've only fairly recently been taking measurements um, like that, but actually we can look back, um, we can take cores, and there's many different ways that we can look um, at the temperature from from hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years ago. Um, Core being drilling and extracting. Pull, yeah, like pulling cores of sediment out of uh, of the ground, and you can look at exactly what the atmosphere was like at that time um, from, from, from the different chemical you know, constituents. Um, and yeah, it's the scale. It's we've obviously had different temperature. We, we've had times that have been a lot hotter and a lot colder than this. We've obviously had ice ages and and things like that. The thing that makes climate change now such a pressing, um, in fact, a critical issue is the speed at which things are changing. So temperature has fluctuated for hundreds and hundreds of thousands of years. Nobody is denying that. But what we are saying is that when you look at how closely it correlates um, with the burning and introduction of fossil fuels um, and how quickly that temperature is changing, I mean, you can look at a graph and, and it's called the hockey stick graph. Um, once we get to about, you know, 1850s or whatever, it just hikes right up. And if that temperature change was to happen over hundreds of thousands of years, like it has done in the past, that would be no problem because, you know, we have this thing called evolution and species could adapt to it. Species are not able to adapt to these changes as quickly as they are happening. And that is the problem. Um, that's why it's such a big you know, it's a. It could mean you know very dark days for us all, really. So again, stupid question. Having not studied history, talk about the ice age. Was that something that happened over a long period of time, and evolution adapted, and then it went away? How did that? When we look at that hockey stick of now, of what let's say the humans are doing to the Earth, is that? I don't know how the ice age came about. I don't know what prompted that cold snap i don't so, know <laughs> there's been there's been i mean i'm not <laughs> no i appreciate that yeah a paleontologist or you know a geologist or anything like that so 
just wearing a science hat for everybody here and doing probably a poor job at all. But we've had um, numerous ice ages throughout um, history um, and they can be caused by various things. So um, I think, was it Krakatoa? Maybe I'm butchering my history, but um, volcanoes doing, you know, huge volcanic eruptions have been enough to put us into very cool mm -hmm. periods. Block out the sun. Block out the sun. Um, and various environmental factors can can close things down. And, you know, when I was talking about that global conveyor belt of the ocean and, and how things have changed, that can kind of push us in and out of, of cold and warm periods and ice ages and such. So, whether that's kind of where you're leading, but if if temperatures are right, it seems counter, but if temperatures are rising, everything happens. Is that something that can cause an ice age? Or is that going to cause something completely different in that sense? Like as in, because it, I know nothing about it, and I apologise. Is is that where we could go if something happens, or is that more that we're all going to die off from it, and then suddenly it reset, and then something will happen? Yeah. I apologise. I'm trying to make you predict the future of it, <laughs> but it's kind of when we talk about, you know, we always think back and uh, what Martin said there about, oh, look at the ice age, how it has happened. I appreciate we have like said in the last 150 years or there about that hockey stick. Yeah, kind of. How how high does that stick go? Mm. There's a really um, there's some fantastic videos that Sky did um, that showed that show exactly what will happen to Earth as the temperature rises. Um, so yeah, I don't think it's likely to plunge us into an ice age. There there was a theory that um, the melting of the ice caps would. Um, completely stall that global conveyor belt system in the oceans that we first spoke about um and without that system carrying um the heat and distributing the heat more evenly around the planet that that could lead to you know something similar to an ice age but i think what we're more likely to face is um you know huge crop failures um salt water intruding into our fresh water systems the inability for things to grow um basically just can tie a breakdown of our natural living system um which is pretty intense i guess <laughs> quite an intense thing to be talking about on a wednesday so, evening so when again going back to that hockey stick the, the, i've watched speakers talk about that humans are impacting that creating that hockey stick but also the earth does go through these through evolution full stop and the the science is you know, if we hadn't been on the earth, I'm not saying there wouldn't have been a hockey stick, but there would have been the natural evolution. But from what you're saying there, it's pretty clear because that evolution's happened so quickly that it's not just the evolution of the earth that's creating this problem at the moment. It's it's us and it's not so wrapping it's, on the planet. It's not um the earth evolving, it's the species that live on it that evolve depending on what is happening on the earth. Um and yeah, it's categorically you know um there's such clear correlation between fossil fuels being burnt and the temperature increasing um and the co2 content rising in our atmospheres mm. um yeah you know there's there's been various different um there's like the medieval cool cool period there's warm periods and we do naturally go through cold, colder and warmer periods um again it, it it's it's the speed that we are going up. Um, I mean, you know, there's been reports um, and, and a picture circulated that was like 2040 climate predictions showing that like UK and with 40 degrees and, um, and, we're, and we're seeing that now. So I think scientists tend to... Was that not just weather? No, because it, it's it's seeing those those temperatures. It's predicting those summers again. So that would be part of climate rather than a week by week weather. Um, scientists generally, it's their nature to be cautious about making statements. Um, they are, have to make sure what they are saying they can prove, um, and are very driven by evidence. You know, when you look at how a politician makes a decision or says something. It can be based on a whole manner of things. The way that the science, like the scientific community, make things is through experiments, looking at the data, 
and then they're always very cautiously um you know we'll, we'll put a statement out there of saying we think this is happening but we and now with climate change and fossil fuels it's unequivocally this is what is happening and i think a lot of scientists have cut, have said that they wish that they'd been more bold in the last 20 years in making those statements because it might have helped us get our heads around things earlier you know we've kind of, we've had this culture of science where they don't want to overstate anything or make anything that's wrong now this you know they know it unequivocally is is caused by humans and it is is going to make life very challenging for well it's already making life challenging it's just the rich west tends to kind of not be so impacted by it so we kind of it's easier for us to turn a blind eye i think why are we less impacted by it um like places like the maldives and things like that are already massively being impacted by sea level rise um you know places that don't have the infrastructure to deal with um temperatures and and you know places like india they've got these huge old infrastructure systems um that tends to be the the worst climate change impacts uh probably in the global south which is where the poorer nations are um so it, mm. we are kind of and and the really sad thing is that it's it's not all humans that have done this it's kind of us the richer west that have demanded this very high carbon lifestyle you know it's people often blame like china and and india for their carbon outputs but actually if you look at it in there's two interesting ways i think to look at it um one is the historic carbon um that each country has used and by far the uk and england are much higher than any of those nations it's just that they're at a time where they are trying to develop and we've kind of already done that and we're quite good at saying well look you're now you're now should you shouldn't be you know developing and trying to give a good living standard to your people whereas we've already done that and we've already polluted a huge amount and then there's an also another lens to look at it and it's it's per person and per person uh, and uh, you know we have far higher carbon footprints than the people in in india who have very very small carbon footprints per person it's just that there's a lot of people there but it's our lifestyles that are, and often it's the the very super rich that have the highest carbon footprints, and it kind of goes down like mm. that. So it's 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 too easy to just to kind of blame everybody. Mm. So uh, just to go again, jump back to the ocean side of things. Uh, talk about the rise in temperatures, which then create changes to the ocean thing. So I, I had a look on the on the on the interweb thing and. Uh, talked about like sea temperature uh surface temperature so again i'm I'm assuming that that change in the the movement the heat temperature then just has this knock-on effect that ultimately we all know if there's too many greenhouse gases where the sun boots a bit harder and i get burned and it affects me directly but i guess when it goes down the chain of nature they're the things that are harder for the layman again to see and understand and that's what the message that I suppose climate change people are trying to get out. Yeah. Um, it's that ongoing chain effect. Yeah. And some of the impacts, if so, if you imagine that, you know, heat and temperature is, is energy essentially. So we're putting, it's putting so much more energy in, in that ocean system and that's driving more weather. It's creating more storms. Um, you know, in the U S they're seeing much, much stronger um, hurricanes and, because that energy is just giving that whole system, it's like amping it up. So it's not just, you know, we're going to get more hotter days. It's, it's we're going to get much bigger storms of higher intensities, much more frequent. You know, you see what happens in the Caribbean and in hurricane season, that's all related to climate change because it's just putting more and more energy into that ocean system. The benefits of that? Um, so an example I heard where we talk about, let's say it's hot at the moment. Uh, well, it is hot. And the headline in the media will be 10 people die due to excess heat or heat. But if you look at then the other end of the scale of people who die, if generally the work, you know, the area you live in is getting warmer, then people who struggle to heat who might die from hypothermia, appreciate in the winter, because the base temperature is not as cold in the winter because it's hotter in the summer, mm-hmm. there's actually. Yeah, there's let's say ten people down at the top of the scale, but at the bottom of the scale, it's saving a hundred people because the the global net effect is it's it's warmer. Is the some of that going on where there is two sides to that story? I think um, it's 
climate change doesn't just make it hotter um it makes it makes the weather more extreme so it's that kind of nature trying to rebalance itself so it's too simplistic to say that warmer weather in the summer would mean a, a milder winter yeah we might have a milder winter but we also might have 10 extra storms that kill people on the roads mm-hmm. or um you know flooding you know it, it leads to flooding larger storms um so actually it's much more dangerous for for people um generally with more extreme weather mm. food production and, and you know you think about how much food you go to shop right and how much food is from southern europe if we keep having really really hot summers they're not going to be able to produce food anymore so it's actually about how we do we feed ourselves um you know all these systems are built on what has been a relatively okay climatic system for the last few hundred years and that's changing um and so yeah a couple of lives saved through a milder winter would have knock on effect you know storms Mm. and i just want to make another simplistic statement as well so if this change is causing more sporadic storms heat waves over the land does that not mean you could produce more solar power wind turbines you know if if is that not potentially a trade-off that these things are happening, but as a race we could go, okay, let's adapt and build better systems to to take use to use that. Yeah, we're we're storing that energy up. Well, can we not take it back out via more solar, more renewable, solar panels, yeah, more energy, more renewable ways? Yeah, I think the thing with renewable energy is that what we want is a consistent supply of energy. We don't want um, sporadic events where the where those elements are hitting us in, in really extreme. Um, part of the challenge that we have with renewables is being able to store that energy. So um, battery storage is increasing all the time. But right now, what we really want to get to is a really nice place where we have a really consistent energy that we can use all the time. We don't want to be like, oh, well, I need to wait for that storm Doris to come so I can put the kettle on, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously more extreme um, weathers can actually impact infrastructure. We saw this week in London, they had to cancel a lot of trains because the rail rails are getting too hot and they were scared that it was going to derail or catch fire. Um, those extreme events change and put additional pressure on the systems that we already have in place, those transport networks, those ways of feeding ourselves Um you know, renewable energy is fantastic and exactly what we should be utilising to get us through it, but we shouldn't be using climate change as a motivator for generating more energy with renewable energy, you know. To go back to your message earlier about changing, the, you know, if there's heat changes in the where food's produced and then it can't grow the crops and we're thinking kind of far ahead how that will impact us. I suppose the analogy is if you look at what's happened in, with Ukraine and our supply of oil, that because of, a, of, a, of an action we didn't forecast, I suppose, that oil's cut off, everyone's petrol prices go up because we're looking at other mm-hmm. ways to get that oil in. I suppose the, the food aspect, because tomorrow if where we got all our cherries in the world, suddenly the air temperature went up 10 degrees and they didn't produce cherries anymore. Mm-hmm. We couldn't have those cherries. So I suppose in this, the we, we can foresee that problem where we couldn't see Ukraine and the oil being cut off really, I guess, but we can with potentially the impact of climate change. Yeah, well, it's hard to, to, to model and people are doing that modeling, but it's just whether it's the same as, um, you know, other animals. Can we evolve quick enough to deal with what's changing? Mm. You know, can we change complete food systems to feed ourselves in a different way where we don't actually know whether that place that we're moving things to might be impacted? They might get way more rainfall and not be able to produce the food that we're looking to. So it's the uncertainty that comes with climate change. Will we ever be able to, I don't know, I can't remember the right term, but uh, man-made food. So, but we've got a name, what's it got a name? Oh, when you like grow meat in the yeah, lab and yeah, things like yeah. that. Is that, is that, appreciating I mean, that's a GM. You're wrong. Yeah, I mean, it kind of goes back to that. I mean, I always liken it to that conversation that Elon Musk loves about um, going to Mars. You know, we have a perfectly good mm-hmm. system that we can live in, breathe in, produce food in, if we take care of it. We don't need to build factories and run them on fossil fuels to grow isn't food. That, isn't it? You look at then human nature of like, we, we, we work around every path of leaf resistance. So to me, the leaf resistance is the climate, fix the climate, but we're not. 
well, we are to a point, but we're also focused on the, the Mars or the genetic grown food. It feels like we need to create resistance paths or remove resistances to so we go down that the right path. Yeah, I think I think it's about reframing things and again reconnecting with things. I mean, we've only been growing th- food for the last twelve thousand years, and it's literally only in the last two hundred years that we've started this kind of crazy consumption of everything and um, making ourselves and the rest of the planet very unhealthy in the process. So, you know. I don't think it's a huge, it's, I think it's in our ancestral makeup to be connected to the land. And I think that we were talking about with the COVID, with the pandemic, I think we got a little window of that, of what it was like to be a little bit more connected to where we were and to our families and, and those simpler things in life. And um, yeah, I truly believe that, that people want that. I just think it takes a little bit of time to get there. And there's always going to be the Elon Musks that have these kind of crazy ideas of going to a a red <laughs> planet that would kill you once you entered it unless you kind of lived in a dome. But that's just human nature and we are naturally curious and we like to explore and we can actually gain a lot from those kind of wacky out there things. You know, a lot of the technology that he develops will probably push us forward in a lot of other areas. Um, so I don't think we should ever like advocate for not exploring technology and Technology has definitely got some amazing things that are going to help us with many of the challenges we face. But I think the nature side of things plays as an equally important part. So it's like half technology and half going back a bit to our roots and connecting with our land and and the people around us and coming up with solutions in that sense as well. Mm -hmm. So just to say then, can I ask what, what, what you do then in terms of connecting to the space? Is it just for anyone else thinking of, okay, well, what, what, what could I do? Yes, I'm not going to create technological advances. Okay, someone might, but as a normal person, what, what, what could I do to kind of yeah, fix that? Absolutely. I mean, I'm, I just love, I love being out in nature. Um, I spend as much time in the sea as I can, um, free diving and swimming and diving. Um, I also got a dog recently and I mean, I used to love going out for walks anyway, but I feel like having a dog takes you out into nature every day, twice a day. And that's been a fantastic thing for me. Also that monotony of kind of walking has given me a really good space to kind of think and, um, and figure out what I want. I think that's what I would say people to do is don't panic (laughs) first and foremost, and try and give yourself some space to think about what you really care about and what really like sets your soul on fire. What are you passionate about? What are you really interested in? And start following that, even if you can only do it like for an hour a week or for a day, or maybe you can start weaving your way into doing something that really makes you excited because we need more people that are passionate about life and passionate about finding um, the joy and the wonder in life to help us build a better future you know we're not we're not just trying to find not just trying to technologically advance ourselves into the future we're trying to create a more joyous more connected future people can start doing that now by listening to themselves and figuring what, out what they want not what the well, not what society tells them they should want what they want and i think it that for me from the conversations i've had with people they te- that those passions tend to align more with where we're trying to go in terms of how we treat the environment and each other and the planet. Um, and I, for me, that's the best thing you can do. Very question, well I'm, question I meant to ask earlier, when you talk about climate change and there's unequivocal evidence that uh, we're doing that. So obviously people out there that disagree with that comment, and let's just use, well, it doesn't really matter who said, but what's their motivation. So let's just use Trump as an example where he'll be a climate denier, whatever they're right. Okay. You don't need to label someone. He doesn't believe that's the case. I think he pulled out of COP. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Appreciate what we might be talking about. I'm not talking about an individual here, but where's the, where do you see the either motives or the, the if you're saying there's that much research and that much data to show we're going in this direction, why is someone saying we're going in this direction? Yeah, I think... I think there'll be a variety of reasons. I think it's a really it's a really huge topic and to get your head around and 
it's hard to imagine something that's so big and you kind of go outside and you look and there's still leaves on the trees and the birds are still cheeping. You're like, well, I just don't believe it. <laughs> you know, I just don't want to believe it. You know, who wants to believe that we've spent the last hundred or so years pumping something into the atmosphere that has potential to kill us all? So I think there's a the motivation there that it's just maybe a bit too big and out there for some people to want to get their heads around. I think money has been a huge motivator for people to 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 not um take climate change seriously. You know, oil and gas is big, big money. And those companies have spent millions and millions and millions of pounds actively putting false messages into the public about it. Um which they've now gone to court and and, be, and been found to to have done that. So the the likes of the Trumps and you know the the senators in the U.S. that are completely pro. You'll probably find that a lot of the hands have been furnished with money from oil, um, and they're working in systems that kind of prioritize them. Fix that system first before we fix. I think we need to design a new system. Is my opinion. There's different ways of doing it. I think design a new system that works better for people, and people want to live like that. Um, Sorry, when I talk to my top political system. Oh, the political system. Well, I think we're finding now it's already dissolving. I think our bigger challenge is finding something that will work better. That's our challenge. We don't need to look back at something that's archaic and doesn't work and sexist and flawed and. You know, it's so flawed. <laughs> yeah, I think everyone would agree. It's now we have to focus on trying to find out something better in terms of how we. That, that that system, I think, unless there's a, I suppose, a revolution, and again, I'm just just speaking off the top of my head here. That change has to come. To change the political system, the people in the political system have to change it. The chances are they're in that system already, and therefore, what's the benefits to potentially? reduce their power and reduce their is again is do you think that's possible without a revolution i don't know again very deep here yeah, i appreciate it it. it's not very climate oh well it is climate you know it's yeah, all well, related it's, the, that impact it's on, yeah. completely related do i think we need a revolution <laughs> well, not, not quite what i said uh, to the people listening but yeah but like the beatles song yeah. well <laughs> um yeah i think we need like a cultural revolution i think culture drives politics I think politic politicians are influenced and do what the public want them to do. There's no doubt in my mind that they will change in 10 years because it will change because it changes anyway. You know, change is guaranteed. Mm. The political system now is not the same political system as 10 years ago. We have mm. an, we have a choice to change culturally to put these important things on the table and then I'll hopefully, unless we have some kind of revolution that tears everything down, <laughs> they will listen to that and act accordingly. Whether we have the time to do that, I don't know. Do you think they listen when you... Th it's about the financial crisis. Again, I'm thinking, trying to put pieces together, but financial crisis, we all scream that the banking system's a complete scam and they put some checks and balances in place to appease the raucous revolution that's going on outside outside the doors we all disperse and get on with our lives the reality is the underlying it's not changed it's still the same system underneath it's still ability to buy influence and influence is friend that you know contributions to a political party that then makes sure that taxes isn't on fossil fuel whatever that might be mm -hmm. so is it is it changing though that's or is it just sugarcoated over to sh shut those voices up for a little while yeah, I don't know. It's different, isn't it? The, the political system in the UK is so different from over on the island. I think one of the mm. real benefits yeah. we have over here is that... Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. You can totally influence politicians over here. You can email your MHKs and they listen to you because I've worked as a civil servant and I've seen an email that's gone to an MHK and then everybody has to click their fingers and work to answer it and it can change policy very quickly. Um, I think that's one of the good things about living in a small community is that you have the ability to change those things. Um, in UK politics, I mean, I'm not a political girl. I don't know that much about UK politics in terms of it just looks like a complete shit show <laughs> at the moment. Um, 
I think local councils really probably hold more of the answer in terms of dealing with the climate and ecological crisis and putting their communities first. They understand what challenges their communities face and often they are taking the action to try and address that. Um, so you've got the pump and the drama and all that going on. I think, I mean, hopefully we won't always have that, but maybe there'll always be a degree of that. And that old archaic trundling system that kind of isn't working. But who knows? I mean, we've had some crazy years and maybe maybe things will completely change. Something similar to that then. What's your thoughts on protesting in that sense to it? Because I'm only talking from someone who saw a few days ago with cycling on Tour de France, people sat on the road, stop it, talking about protesting climate change and things like that. Do you think it has a place? Do you think it annoys people more than it highlights the issue? Or does the message kind of get blurred in, in that sense? Or or I guess as well, have you ever been in one? Um, I've been to a few protests. I haven't been to any of the XR ones, but that's not through any kind of stance on it. I, th- I was thinking about that because it kind of comes up quite often. You see Richard Maidley being a complete spoon on Good Morning Britain talking to XR protesters. I can't really think of a time in the last 100 years, 200 years, that real change wasn't brought about by some kind of protest. If you think about the suffragettes, um, you know, the the kind of segregational movement in America, um, women's rights, like... It's all been brought about by a form of protest. And I get that it's annoying, but you know what's more annoying is not being able to feed yourself in like 10, 15 years. And I think the people who take that step to to disrupt society aren't taking that lightly. Um, They've read the science and it's scary, you know? Like when I first, I you know, I, I've told you now I'm not a, climate scientist but when I started working more on climate change and developing climate change policy did a bit of a deep dive into the research and it's incredibly scary and I think most of us go on about our daily lives and we and it's very easy to ignore it because we live in the west and and we're afforded those luxuries those protesters that are aware of what might happen I mean I probably went through about six months of of I'd say what was like a state of mourning of not knowing what to do after what I I read I didn't know what to do knew that people weren't taking anything seriously but it was really scary and I think kudos to them if they want to go and, and try and move the dial a little bit more because I think that's the only thing in the last hundred years that has really brought about real change on a political and cultural level so that's kind of where I'm I'm at with it Sounds like a helicopter's line. <laughs> line <banana. laughs> um, you mentioned there. That's a Must be listening. Oh, is a helicopter? Yeah. Yeah. Sorry about the background yeah, noise. <laughs> you mentioned their group XR. Who are they? What do they do? So XR is Extinction Rebellion, and they um, basically take direct non-violent action to disrupt society. Um, enough to try and bring political and cultural attention to the climate and biodiversity crisis. Um, I think the interesting thing about XR, is, and probably something that not everybody knows, is that it's not a centralised organisation. They have they have values and they have aims and they have goals, but anybody who joins XR can do something to try and make a difference there's not a leader that is telling you need to do that you need to do that they organize themselves in different ways so there have been instances where they've held their hands up and said look this group did something that we wouldn't necessarily advocate you know stopping people getting to work on tubes in the morning rush hour in hindsight probably wasn't the best way of spreading their message but these people are trying to change the course of history and 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 not to put it lightly, save humanity, you know, they're going to make mistakes. And I think we hold environmental protesters, scientists, um, people who are passionate to the very high, high stringent regard 
And it feels like everything they have to do has to be perfect or we won't listen to them. And it feels like that's just a good excuse not to listen because everybody else is allowed to make mistakes and be human. And and you know what I mean? It just feels like, well, that's actually... I've, they've done this one thing that I don't agree with, so therefore... I'm not listening to anything they say. And it's like, well, are you sure it's not just convenient that you just don't really want to listen to what they want to say because it's quite a hard message to listen to? Take you see a big... Uh, uh, Putting your heads, that's the right word, between that economic, social and science that trying to get that balance, it must be challenge. I actually think... Um, I don't think it's that challenging. I think it's challenging in the current system that we have. But I think that when you balance, I, I, th- I mean, I think when you prioritise, it just seems that at the moment the environment is always probably one of the first things to be taken off the list. <laughs> and we're like, oh, well, we'll sacrifice the environment and we can make some money. But actually you can still make money. You can make really good profits. And there's businesses that have been doing it for years the whole models are about looking after the environment and looking after people. Um, and I think we're seeing that more and more that actually the future is going to be, you make economic gain by doing environmental good. At the moment, we still, um, there's more money gained from cutting down a tree and cutting down and using the wood and making products than there is for protecting a tree. But that's that's changing now. You know, we're we're seeing things like carbon carbon credits and protecting areas and businesses doing things for ESG reasons that actually mean that we're actually going to start valuing um, those those trees and habitats that are there doing their own thing. It's called ecosystem services, but I I think ecosystem functions is a better term. You know, realising that having clean air means we can breathe, having clean water means that we can drink, you know, trees perform perform a function and therefore have a value. Because, you know, if we cut down everything, polluted everything, we wouldn't be able to survive. So it's like the understanding that we need thriving, healthy, natural ecosystems in order to thrive economically as well. And then, uh, again, just to appreciate it's not not the answer, but do we have bigger problems in the world? This country sat on nuclear weapons. Should that ever deter us from keeping our eye on the ball in regard? I appreciate your answer is going to be no, but... In the, we also there, and you know, Putin's not going to hopefully drop a, a nuclear weapon on people. But well, you know, with nuclear, I just don't know. It's, again, it's an easy excuse to go. You know, what, I'd love to plant some more trees, but look, someone's going to nuke the planet in the next hundred years. So who cares? <laughs> yeah, well, who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? But I'd prefer to live my life doing as much good as I could and connecting with people and having a really good mm-hmm. time. I don't think that we need to sacrifice to for the environment and for climate. I think actually what I'm advocating is a much more aligned, joyful life that we get to spend time with our loved ones and, and we get to do good. And I think that is naturally more aligned with human nature. Um, so who knows, we might get nuked tomorrow, but I'd much prefer to say that I lived in a way that was sensitive to the people around me and to the planet I lived on. And I and I lived like a custodian rather than somebody that I could use and abuse as much as I wanted. It's an interesting thought process, yeah. And the right one, yeah. I suppose I go back to a talk, different subject that we talked about with uh, the guy from All Blacks. Mm-hmm. And he talked about taking the jersey on as an All Black and he's just the custodian of that jersey for a period of time. So he took it, he was the number nine for X number of years and passes it on and it's just much like the planet. We're here uh, to look after and pass it on to the next set of people, which is maybe often what we don't think of. Yeah, we're borrowing it from our future children. You know, I want, you know, if I ever have kids, I want them to enjoy the planet and I want them to see beautiful sunrises and see the birds and, and go to the beach. And, you know, I don't want to live them in a polluted cityscape where mm-hmm. <laughs> they can't breathe and have to wear a mask because we've polluted things and, and have to eat, you know, food that's been made in a factory and has the right nutritional content but never saw the light of day <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the the movement and the, the terminology net zero which is again something you see which again having been educated in the last hour that's ultimately about what's our footprint out on a carbon side and how can we offset that is that uh is that a realistic way of approaching climate change 
or should it be well don't put any carbon out don't try and offset it so it's like eating a thousand calories and then going for a run well just don't eat a thousand calories and you don't need to do the run is that the net zero the right way to approach it or a one of the challenge you know is it i think net zero net zero means that we're not putting any more carbon into the atmosphere than that budget can allow because we are doing things like restoring our natural ecosystems so they're absorbing carbon um i think hopefully in the future technology will get to a place where we don't need to use fossil fuels and 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 that sort of thing and and we're, we're not quite there yet we're still developing technologies i think there is challenge around offsets and it can be seen as a form of greenwashing I think there's a role for the right kind of offsetting when a business or an individual has done everything that they can to reduce their carbon footprint through changes and there is still a small amount left. Helping to restore these systems that we've trashed over the last hundred years is a good thing in my in my um, personal opinion. I think restoring our forests, our salt marshes, our mangroves and, and paying to do so and letting them do their natural function, which is store carbon, I mean, I think I always think it's an interesting um, fact that kind of puts things into perspective. So we're all made of carbon, aren't we? Um, and actually, some whales are made out of uh, of as much carbon as a, as a thousand trees. So if you imagine that we have hunted some species of whales to one percent of what they once were, you can imagine how protecting our oceans and making sure some of those populations will naturally absorb so much more carbon, just their presence, rather than that being in the atmosphere. You can see that we've got so much work to do in terms of restoring our system, our planetary system to what it once was. Um, but that's where I think the role of off- offsets plays a part. Mm. Proper douchebag, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think it's about, it's not about feeling shame or guilt. It's about like let's just crack on and do something good you know (laughs) that's all it is you know no shame no pointing fingers i don't point any fingers at the fossil fuel companies people are just trying to feed their families um put food on the table yeah there is a lot of greed in the world um and money has driven that but let's that's too late for pointing fingers let's just do better (laughs) so let's talk about the project you're working with the government to begin to explain yeah, so we're running, um, it's called the Manx Blue Carbon Project. Um, and basically, basically, we're looking at how we can manage our seas to restore. And I say we, this is Isle of Man specific. This is Isle of Man specific. We're working with um, the National Oceanography Centre down in Southampton um, and Swansea University and Bangor University. So we've got some amazingly clever bods working with us as well. Um, and basically looking at how we can tweak the management of our seas to make sure it's it's storing as much carbon um health you know safely in its habitats by restoring and protecting those habitats um and yeah how we can look to restore those systems and basically that's we've got a really strong long history of marine science in the island and it's really where we can show that we are larger than the sum of our parts because we can be an example for the rest of the the world more island nations how they can protect and restore their seas as well so it's um it shows we're doing quite innovative work talk about some of yeah so we're looking at the carbon content um so we're going out and taking these cores in um in our near shore environment which is on our, our beaches and coastlines and then going out in boats and looking at how much carbon is stored there we're answering some really important questions around how seabed disturbance from fishing is impacting carbon and then looking at how well we are still in the very early stages of it so they are starting to analyze samples at the moment um let's go back to your commentary earlier about appreciate it's a whale but again if we're taking fish out of the sea presume all fish in some way are taking in carbon that yeah fishing does have an impact it's just quantifying how big that is yeah absolutely and and i think fisheries globally has been like massive, massively underestimated for actually how much carbon we're taking out of that system. You know, we think um, we waste a lot of fish as well. You know, it'd be one thing if we were eating them all, but we bycatch um, through back a lot of fish, which is just wasted carbon. That's kind of thing back in 
the atmosphere. So mm. we're not even being efficient in the way that we waste carbon, if you know what I mean. Plus, that's the same with food, I assume, also the mass production of food and the waste of food. Yeah, absolutely. Um, food waste is nearly as big as America in terms of emissions globally. Yeah. Yeah, wow. So that project, you've been, when did you join that? And... I developed the project last year and then we started in February of this year. Okay. Yeah. So I've got a colleague, Jackie Keenan, we're um, working, we work for the Alabama government and then we've got our external partners that are coming over to make sure that we're, it is really like cutting edge science. So I presume once the, I don't know whether it's, uh, here's a report and here's the changes or is this just an ongoing yeah, so it's no. about it's in total it's a three year project. Mm-hmm. So we'll have some initial results from the after the first year. Um and then we'll be looking to see how we can really be innovative in terms of our management. Um that might be tweaking fisheries, um, closing different areas or re- replanting seagrass in, in our marine protected areas. The Max Wildlife Trust are doing a trial at the moment where they're replanting some seagrass in Port Erin Bay to see if there used to be there used to be a historic site of seagrass there. So we're just seeing if that can take and if actually we can start restoring some of those seagrass beds around our coastline. So so the question I know I'm for them today. Seagrass, where would I see it? And apart from the obvious questions like, you know, green grass in the water. Grass in the sea. I know, like, I know it's not a stupid one of saying it, but where about would you be seeing it? Is it, you know, a literal, what should be, I guess, a field of it underneath in, in the in the beds? As in, if I went in Port Aaron Beach, would I... Would I see it? Yeah, so probably some of the best places to see it are um, Gansey Point. There's a seagrass bed there. Do you know? Um, yeah. hmm. Fort Island, there's a, there's a patch around Fort Island down um, by the old Gulf Links Hotel. The, our biggest patch is um, off Ramsey Bay between the, the pier, the old pier, and Port the Wave. There's a really large patch there. We took a filmmaker out there actually recently and we saw loads of cat sharks. And you know, So these areas, as well as being good for storing carbon, are also really important for biodiversity um, and they do all sorts of other important ecosystem functions as well. I will. Um, they improve water quality. They protect our shorelines from, from coastal erosion and actually um, dampen wave energy so their our coastlines get less impacted by storms. Um, and they act as nursery grounds for both commercially um, important fish and endangered species as well. Mm. Now, when we look at uh, plastics, the impact on that on oceans, what do you see and what do you... Yeah, yeah. I always think that plastics is, I always say it's a good gateway environmental issue because <laughs> it's so easy to see. Um, I mean, everybody will have seen plastic washing up on our shores um we have we have clogged our seas and waterways with plastics um over the last hundred or so years which is pretty incredible when you think about when plastic was first invented and how much we've managed to distribute it all around the planet um so i think it's a a very visual um environmental issue there's also the non-visual aspects of plastic, where it's microplastics as well. Yeah, microplastics. And then there's the kind of fact that it actually impacts us through the food chain as well. So we don't see that plastic, but plastic... We eat the fish that eat the plastic. Yeah, and so plastics often have chemicals associated with them as well, but um, chemicals that we've previously dumped in the ocean like to absorb themselves onto that plastic, which then goes into the fish and the fish go into us. So we're... Funnily enough, feeding ourselves the pollution that we put into the coastlines, which is kind the of irony. irony. <laughs> yeah, the irony's not lost. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the so just to I suppose we talk about cha- making change in habits. So we look at. I was in one of the shops recently and turned up with no bags for life. Sorry, and you know, I I buy five bags to put my shopping in, all homegrown, obviously, uh, and pay. Three two pound for the for the bags, and the rally is not most of us, but reasonable amount of us affluent enough for just like the, the to me the penalty for buying a bag is to discourage you from buying a bag. Mm-hmm. So yeah, it has an impact, and people some people will take bags in. It's like a sugar tax. Let's tax it. Let's create some money to reduce people. Why haven't we as a society or as a human race got the brain capacity to go ban them? Yeah, I mean we are bringing in regulations on the island to ban a lot of single-use plastics 
hopefully at October Tim Ward this year, which is something I've been working on. Why don't we ban them? I guess it's just those old structural systems that still have tight holds on the way that we actually do things and money kind of prevails over sense sometimes, isn't it? Um, but we are finding more and more. So the EU has banned a lot of single-use plastics. Um, France just banned all packaging on fruit and vegetable, oh, plastic okay, packaging on fruit that. and vegetables. Um, What's defined as a single-use plastic? Generally something that is used once and f- for about 15 seconds or less. And then, th- well, technically something that's used once and then thrown away. But if you can recycle plastic is the, the argument from the plastic people, the other side go, we just recycle. Well, you can't recycle all plastics. Okay. Um, and it goes so, back to so that. Can I ask a question then? When you throw plastics into a your tub outside your house, mm-hmm. you mentioned some of that can't be recycled. Are they then filtering that out and going, we can recycle this, but this plastic you need to go and bury or whatever they do with it? Um, yeah, over here they send it to the energy yeah. from waste um, facility to burn it. To burn it. Um, you can recycle plastic, but the problem with plastic really is that it's so cheap to produce that actually recycled plastic has such little value that producers don't really want to buy it. There's no incentive to buy recycled it's plastic. It's more expensive because it's been because recycled. It's, yeah, because it's gone through a process. It's of lower quality, um, and I can buy virgin plastic for nothing. So where's the incentive to buy recycled plastic? The answer really to plastic is to reduce what you know, reduce your usage and, and not everybody relies on recycling as a silver bullet solution. And it's fantastic for things like aluminium, cardboard, paper, glass. We have really good recycling systems in place for those materials. But plastic is just, there's too many different types of plastic. It's too abundant. There's so much of it. I mean, the, the, it just doesn't work. It's not a good thing to recycle. Hmm. And it's made from things that were made million, you know, it's made from oil that was dug up from millions and millions of years ago to use something that we might use for like 15 seconds to eat, to eat a salad and then yeah. throw away. You know, that makes no sense when you think about how much energy it's taken to A, produce it in the first place millions and millions of years ago, dig it up, process it, transport it, make the products, transport the products, put them next to a little... Um, till you stir your coffee and you chuck it in the bin. Yeah. What a waste of resources. <laughs> yeah. yeah. One of the things that, again, I read about, going back to our good friend Carbon Dark Side, is that the, the technology, the looking technology to be able to, let's call purify it, take it out. out. Is that stuff you're aware of? Is that, while it's obviously helpful, again, is it really the right fix to go, well? Um, yes, I think they're doing some innovative work up in Iceland, aren't they? Mm-hmm. They're... Um, pulling carbon out of the atmosphere and putting it into their old um like chambers under the under the earth surface where they may have had old gas deposits and that sort of thing i think you can also make it into solids and diamonds and that sort of thing as well but all interesting technologies and i think technology definitely has a role to play in in getting to where we need to get to but we can't rely on technology alone we have to change our behavior as well and the uh, just to go, sorry, go back to plastics in the ocean. Uh, how big a problem is that for the ecosystem within the ocean? I assume obviously it is, but more plastic that gets. Yeah, I mean, it's huge. The amount of species that have now been found with plastic in their stomachs and they're getting entangled in it. And I mean, you see these incredible, I sailed from Hawaii to Vancouver on a on a sailing boat with 14 women across the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Hmm. And you see... To explain that patch to us. It's the densest accumulation of marine plastic found anywhere on Earth. And it's accumulated because of currents. Yeah. So those currents basically move around that ocean basin in a clockwise fashion and push. You know, when you take a your plug out of the bath mm. and the bubbles kind of spin around and form a circle where the plug is, it's kind of same sort of deal. It's all pushing into the center. So they think it's about three times the size of Texas. We sailed through it for two and a half weeks. Um, and you see these incredible albatross that are, you know, their wingspan is probably like double my arm span. Um, 
and they go on these huge trips out from the Hawaiian Islands. They can go on, you know, one feeding trip can be a 10,000 mile trip and you'd see these incredible birds. Um, and they've obviously, they've been around for hundreds of thousands of years. Um, and they are designed through evolution to look at the, uh, the water surface and pick up what they find. Now, 200 years ago, that might be a morsel of fish or a shrimp or something that's kind of made its way up to the ocean surface. Now that is plastic predominantly. So these animals, the, these beautiful, incredible species are scooping up bellies full of plastic and then going back to these Hawaiian islands and feeding their chicks huge volumes of plastic to the point where these chicks can't fledge anymore. Um, you've probably seen those images of albatross chicks that have died in their skeletons and there's just a pile of plastic that was in their bellies. So we are choking the earth and the species that live on it with plastic um, and affecting ourselves too. You know, it's not just far off, you know, birds that live in, in Hawaii. We are seeing now that we're affecting our own um, our own bodies through through eating eating fish and eating those chemicals and that's affecting our endocrine system our reproductive system um you know um yeah all sorts of nasty ways of, mm. of impacting us as well hmm. how how clean would you say the alaban is then on a scale of where you're looking at you know from some of your research you'll go out on, on boats and that sort of sense well, where, where would we rank? Um, I mean, we've got there's different sources of pollution, isn't there? So, in terms of plastic pollution, um, we definitely have plastic um, washing up on our beaches in our, in our waters. Um, not as much as those denser accumulation zones that you find um, where all the currents are pushing them into the centre of our oceans. Um, in terms of other pollutants, we don't have much industry on the island um, that are doing that, those kind of pollute that kind of pollution. But we do have historic um, pollution sites from from mines and things like that, and we're still pumping raw sewage into the sea. So, you know, I'd say that we are we're doing probably pretty well compared to other places that, that we've kind of probably outsourced our pollution to. Um, but we're definitely not. We could do better. Yeah. yeah. Go back to plastic. I read a stat and I just read my score. So I read about a study in 2017 and it said that 9.1 billion tonnes of plastic has been produced since 1950. 7 billion is no longer in use. It's just 7 billion's worth of plastic. 9% of that's been recycled. 12% has been burned, which leaves 80%, which is uh, burnt or buried, sorry. So that's the other 80%. Where is it? Mm -hmm. And they're saying, sorry, yeah, it's either in the land or in the oceans. Yeah. So absolutely. of that, 7 billion, 80% of it's... Yeah. I read a crazy fact that said, well, it's the, a report that said that um, a study had looked at people with IBS and found that people with IBS have got much more microplastics in their stomachs mm -hmm. and in their intestines and bowels. And they think that that might be down to drinking... Water, you know, water bottle from single-use water bottles, which have been found to contain a lot of microplastics. Yeah, and, and they had poly something because they changed bottles, didn't they, a while ago? And just now you get one-use plastic, but it'll say it doesn't include poly. So PCBs, yeah. but um, I mean, I think that's a bit of a farce as well, really, because it's quite easy for them to very like tweak the plastic compound, and it's not PCB, but it's like PCB one three five nine or something like that, and it's like, yeah, no PCBs, mm. but. Still not great for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, so on our last podcast, or the one before, we were chatting with uh, Angela uh, Klukas, who's, di di I suppose, diet and nutrition, and we were talking about the gut and how the gut impacts. They're talking about the green second brain and how it impacts mood, everything, mood, the lot. So then you think about you're throwing, aside from, let's call it, not great food in there, you're then throwing not food in there, you're throwing plastics, mm -hmm. et cetera, toxins. The knock-on impacts, quite scary. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm a massive advocate for um, a healthy body and a healthy mm. planet. You know, yeah, I think yeah. we have to treat it all a lot better. <laughs> so I just got one more question. You touched on earlier. You did this deep dive in the research, and you kind of came out of it. 
Was there a stage where I suppose you look at protesters as well, and often there's a, there's an angry side to protest. Mm. And you came out of that research, and from time to time, you obviously spoke very well here, and you're very calm about the situation. But is there an underlying frustration and anger that sometimes there isn't a light at the end of the tunnel, or is it just about staying positive and trying to do your bit? Yeah, no, it's a complete journey and um, depends on where I'm at at that time. Like, I feel incredible frustration, you know, want to cry, want to scream, you know, especially working within the system trying to change it. It's going to be incredibly frustrating um, and it's a constant battle to remind myself to live in the present, to do as good as I can do. Um, to 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 enjoy life and to experience joy this year i think i went through that mm, last year and the year before and really put as much as effort as i could into to changing things and to kind of and i'm and i'm still doing that now but i'm definitely doing it from a place um of ensuring that i live my life in a way that has joy um and connection so we bought a cheap little sailing boat. I go out sailing. I get in the sea as much as I can. Um, I just try and connect with people and live with joy. So whatever happens, I don't want to waste my life. Um, being angry at it. Being angry at it. And it doesn't mean that I'm not angry sometimes. <laughs> sometimes I'm really angry. But I try and steer myself back onto that course of being like, just do what you can do. Mm. You know, no, not one individual is going to change everything. Um, I'm not try, I try and stay away from that saviour complex, yeah. but I am trying to do what I can do whilst living in a life in a way that you know makes me happy and fulfilled. So, so on that point, and everyone sort of contributing and, and Matt's question earlier, people listening, what are those? You know, if you had to kind of give four or five, let's call it environmental habit tips to people mm-hmm. listening, what what would that be? Yeah, I I always I feel like it takes away when you're like, oh, bring a reusable bottle, da 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 da. For me, which we've all got here, yeah. which was very nicely supplied. <laughs> um, for me, it's about becoming more aware in general, but through a place of your own natural curiosity. You know, there's so much to learn um, and so much to do that really, if you follow your intuition with it and follow, follow your curiosity and, and, you know, ha, oh, that's kind of interesting. Or I've always really been passionate about, um, maybe people are passionate about, you know, plastics and litter and beaches or, or I've really always really been interested in birds or wildflowers or, you know, find something that really interests you and take a dive into that. Talk to people about how you feel about the environmental and climate crisis, because, I can guarantee people are feeling as confused and scared as you are and starting to have a conversation about it is the best way to start moving things in a different direction. Um, be kind to people. Stop <laughs> throwing stones on Facebook and Instagram. And, well, Instagram's got you fairly friendly. On Twitter, you know, let's stop pointing fingers and getting angry and just get on with it and do some good. Um and yeah, that's that's probably where I'd say. And spend time in nature. Enjoy yeah, yeah. enjoy nature and, and and find joy in your own life. Wonderful. Yeah, no, thank you. And I suppose part of that conversation, starting that conversation was I think a part of education for for everyone. We can all learn more and so that was certainly one of the drivers for, for asking you to come in. So I appreciate spending an hour forty wow. um, <laughs> uh, chat chatting and, and educating us a bit more. So thanks very much. No, thanks thank for you. having me. Pleasure. Thanks for for listening. We hope you found it helpful. 